six inches away from the front bumper of my car was a freight train going right across the road. Every moment in time creates questions the human mind cannot answer. Out of reach, past all we can see, hear, and touch. Beyond all we understand lies. The Extraordinary. Good evening. I'm Corbin Bernson. Welcome to The Extraordinary. The extraordinary is a lonely road, unexplained lights in the sky, and strange space creatures on the ground. They believe that they've seen a UFO, they believe they've seen an entity, uh, and they believe that they were examined. For the first time, aliens seen by not one, not two, but three groups of people at the same time. Some people might compare it to being raped, you know what I mean? It's, it's such a shock to the system. These aliens left physical scars on their victims. The extraordinary is the dark, foggy night a voice screamed stop to Buddy Maxwell as he drove along a country road. And I heard this voice in my ear, very plain, very distinct. And the locomotive that missed his carload of passengers by six inches. Surely at the speed I was traveling, we would have been killed if I just ignored that last stop. It is the secret Christine Reichenbach learned about the mysterious stranger who followed her as she drove to work. What neither of them knew was they had been born 14 minutes apart in the same room. And their mothers and speculated they would one day meet and marry. They did. The Extraordinary is the showdown between this gorilla and the first female apes he has ever encountered. <laughs> Only dominant apes can mate. What would Ivan do? Just some of the stories that lie beyond our normal understanding. Tonight on... The Extraordinary. They occur at night when our senses are peaked. They happen in darkness when we cannot see all that is out there. We don't often believe those who say that they've seen aliens. But then comes along a case like this one, and we're forced to, once again, reconsider. Warwick Moss has this story of no ordinary encounter. Investigators say it may be one of the most important sightings ever documented. I felt the most incredible fear go through me. It was like a, a power a source of some sort. I was raving hysterically. I was convinced I, I was uh, uh, face on with the epitome of all evil. A terrifying encounter of the worst kind. Blinding lights, towering figures with blazing red eyes, an overpowering sense of menace that ended in violence, a nightmare, or an attack by aliens. Kelly Carl knows what she experienced. And all the evidence points to a UFO and its grotesque crew. I suppose um, 
some people might compare it to being raped, you know what I mean? It's, it's such a shock to the system that um, it's something you can never forget. Kelly Carl still bears the emotional scars of that encounter. So much so that she asked us to protect her identity as much as we could. Returning to the scene reopens old wounds, brings the fragmented memories flooding back. Memories of a terrifying night two years ago when she confronted unearthly evil. Here's something that wasn't supposed to exist, and it does. It's as simple as that, it does. It, it exists. There's nothing anyone can tell me to say it doesn't now. Yet, two years ago, if someone had told me that they'd had a run-in with a UFO, um, I suppose I would have thought they needed to be locked up. <laughs> a mountain road in August, the winter of 1993. It's around midnight. Kelly and her husband are driving home after visiting friends. Suddenly, a bright light pierces the darkness. Kelly's cosy, logical life is about to be shattered into a million mysterious pieces. We kept driving for about two or three kilometres, um, turned a bend in the road and there was a, um, or I suppose you could say a house-sized craft sitting in the middle of the field. It was, um, it looked like round orange lights with some sort of blue fluorescent, um, I don't know whether it was gaseous or solid underneath that hit the ground in a semicircle. Even then, the words unidentified flying object, UFO, hammered at Kelly's brain. She and her husband seemed magnetically drawn to the lights, the craft, and whatever lay within. There was a sickening smell in the air. Waves of nausea crashed over them. The next thing you know, there's a figure standing in the field and uh, then there was about seven or eight of them. Everything really happened too quickly. Um, I, I went hysterical, I've got to admit it. I, um, I started screaming out that they've got no souls and the next thing I know I've been hit in the stomach and I've gone back through the air and landed flat on my back. I actually threw up through fear out there, but um, basically I was hysterical. There was some sort of conversation going on that I only got bits and pieces of. Funny little cliche lines like, um, we don't mean you any harm and we're, we're a peaceful people. But at the same time, I've been, here I have, I've been thrown back through the air and nearly had the life knocked out of me. Then silence darkness, the craft, the figures disappeared. Kelly and her husband found themselves back where they began, in their car parked by the roadside. By Kelly's reckoning, the terror lasted just 10 minutes, yet in actual fact, more than an hour had gone by, an hour Kelly could not account for. The question is, what horrors occurred during all that lost time? It's a question no one has been able to answer. Not even John Ockertel, one of the world's leading UFO researchers, can shed any light on that part of the mystery. He and a team of independent investigators have studied the incident for more than a year, and they've reached some startling conclusions. We try to knock their case over, and in the end, if they if it holds up, it's um, we believe the scales are in their favour. And in consequence of Kelly's case, everything she gave us um, held true, and uh, uh, we were very confident that we had a good case on our hands. John Orcatel's team asked Kelly to sketch her impressions of the craft and the flame-eyed figures she confronted. As the drawings took shape. The images from that night returned to haunt Kelly's consciousness. They were about seven foot tall. They just looked black. I mean, I suppose, like silhouettes. It was out on the field at night, but um, when their eyes lit up red, they were like red stoplights, like um, fly's eyes. They were that large on the face that they were like fly's eyes on a fly's face. Kelly's scars from that encounter were not only emotional. 
First, there was the unexplained wound just below her navel that she discovered the morning after. It was just strange. It, it was a, a triangle and it was uh, as if it was a, a burn, um, but not enough to blister it. But um, it was probably more impressive later on when the actual red went away and it left the outline of a scar there. And um, I actually took measurements of that and it was uh, a perfect centimetre everywhere. It was a perfect os isosceles triangle. Then Kelly's abdominal pains began. The initial diagnosis, an unusual infection in the womb, the kind that sometimes follows a miscarriage. But Kelly definitely was not pregnant. And I was placed in hospital and placed on a drip um, of, anti of very strong antibiotics and it seemed to clear up, but there was really no explanation for it all and it was left as an open case at the end too. Could the infection have something to do with what happened that terrifying August night? Could the aliens have... Well, maybe that's too far-fetched to even consider. And far-fetched is probably the conclusion John Ocatell and his researchers would have come to if there had not been this breathtaking discovery. Kelly and her husband were not the only humans there. A second car was parked further down the road behind. What happened next would make this one of the most significant encounters of all time. Kelly Carl's encounter with aliens was significant in its own right, but the events that followed would leave investigators convinced that something out of the ordinary certainly had happened that night. Within sight of Kelly and her husband, two other groups of people would prove beyond doubt this encounter was not imagination. Warwick Moss continues the story. Inside the second car, a married couple Jane and Bill, with a friend called Glenda. At the moment, they're not ready to tell their story on television, but they have given a full account to John Ocatell's team, an account the researchers have investigated and cross-checked against Kelly's version. They believe that they've seen a UFO, uh, in the true sense of the word UFO, unidentified flying object. They believe they've seen an entity, in other words, an alien, uh, and I'm not saying this is a space traveller, uh, but that's their belief. Uh, uh, they believe that the incident did occur in the field, there's no doubt in their mind, uh, and they believe that they were examined. The same field, the same night, the same time, even the same feelings of nausea. But at one point, their experience does diverge from Kelly's. There was no fear, no hysteria just calm and the two women Jane and Glenda believe somehow they were transported from the field they describe then being in a in a craft of some sort they're in a position where they're lying on their back uh, they can view the roof they can't view they can just view the tip of their toes they can see a group of faces 
There's no speech. They can't see any... They, they, they can't speak. However, they, they can hear things going on and they seem to be able to talk to each other, but they, they're not actually speaking. John Ockertel's team asked Glenda and Jane to... Glenda and Jane to sketch what they saw. First, Glenda's impression of the craft. Now, Jane's. But wait a moment. Remember Kelly's impression? Almost identical. Next, the figures they encountered. Glenda drew this. Jane, this. And this is Kelly's drawing of the alien with the blazing red eyes. These drawings help make the case unique. Two totally independent, yet identical experiences documented and investigated by researchers. Rare data that they agree is unbiased and untainted. Coming from two groups of people that had, had never met each other or spoken to each other, and both groups knew nothing at all about UFOs or ufology, um, it was quite uh, a remarkable occurrence to both describe the same thing. And there are other parts of the two stories that coincide. Just as Kelly lost more than an hour after her scuffle in the field, Glenda and Jane also have time they can't account for. An hour, maybe two. Finally, Kelly's scar. Glenda and Jane were injured too. But in their case, there's photographic evidence. What you discover is that uh, they have uh, markings in their, just under their navel, uh, some markings on the inside of their left thigh, and uh, also on one of the girls, uh, they have um, a bruising above the left ankle, uh, like a, a cuff, something cuffed around their leg. In their search for the facts, John Ockertell and his researchers literally left no stone unturned. They went to the scene of the encounter, pinpointed by all three women and took soil samples. These, in turn, were analysed by two different laboratories. We found lots of unusual um, anomalies and also uh, magnetic problems and also uh, lots of uh, changes in the soil chemistry. Those anomalies included an above-average sulphur content, the presence of a rare carbon compound called pyrene, also tannic acid all in a crescent-shaped indentation at the spot where all three women said they saw the UFO. Also, there was uh, a triangle, um, triangle formation on the ground of uh, dead grass, um, which is spaced out um, uh, in the circle itself. So it gave us a lot of good leads that there's something had been on the ground because the physical effects was now starting to take, uh, starting to destroy the grass in the area. So what you have are two groups Two stories, in most respects, identical. A strange craft, unearthly beings, medical evidence of physical force. But there is still one more loose thread to be tied. You see, all three women report there was a third car at the scene that night. The driver was a man, a witness who could hold a vital clue. We believe he's still out there and he'll be suffering like they all suffer with this lack of memory and um, this lost period of time, even probably to the extent where he thinks he's going mad, so uh, he's still out there. As for Kelly Carl, she's still trying to put her damaged life back together, still waiting for the emotional wounds to heal, still desperate to find the missing pieces that will help her understand exactly what happened to her that night in August 1993. You know, I was a married woman with three kids. I was just an average housewife. I mean, now uh, it's ruined my marriage. Um, it, it's ruined my life. It's, uh, it, it's almost to the stage where I wonder if I'm ever going to be able to have a normal life because somewhere along the line, someone's going to know that, you know, this, this has happened to me. Could it be? Or is it all in the mind? Thank 
a huge explosion. Uh, we've got massive fire out here uh, on Dudley here at the river yard. All kinds of stuff on fire. Right there. Okay, we're going Next, for all the wondrous potential of the human mind, it sometimes has its disadvantages. Sometimes it seems we just, oh, we think too much. We, we use our intelligence to decide our limitations when maybe we should just do it. Watch this. You'll see what I mean. We're witnessing a marvel of nature, the will to survive. An amazing dog called Rusty, who has for a long time defied the notion that man's best friend needs four legs to run on. Rusty is fast becoming an international celebrity. Of course, this dog, he got more Christmas cards this year than I did. <laughs> when Bill Davis goes to his mailbox in Greenfield, Iowa these days, he never knows if the mail will be for him or his eight-year-old, 40-pound, two-legged Australian red healer. In 1989, Rusty had a bad face-off with a lawnmower, and it looked like the mower won. But within months, he had taught himself to run and jump again. Bill said he actually clocked Rusty running at 17 miles an hour on his remaining two legs. But a few months later, a second tragedy seemed likely to end Rusty's upright days forever. He was run over by a neighbor's pickup. His one good rear leg was snapped in three places and shattered in six others. Bill thought his best friend was a goner. A one-legged dog wasn't likely to set any speed records. Oh man, <laughs> maybe this maybe that's gonna be the end. Without much hope, Bill took Rusty to the veterinarian teaching hospital in nearby Ames, Iowa. An orthopedic surgeon inserted metal pins in the leg until it healed, and three months later, Rusty took his first new steps as a biped. Oh, I think he gets along real good. And bouncing here on two legs on one side. He bounces a bit as he runs, and he seems to use his tail as a rudder. Sometimes he likes to lean on you a bit for balance. The Australian Red Healer is bred to be a cattle herder, and two-legged or not, Rusty still tries to go about his work, even if the cattle don't take him too seriously anymore. I don't think he can buffalo him anymore here. <laughs> they about know his limitations. Those limitations have made Rusty an international star. He's been on television, received mail from all over the world, and even made the front page of an American magazine with Princess Di. Some say you can't believe all you read, and you should doubt even the pictures you see with your own eyes. But Bill says he's got the proof in his fields every day and the videotape to prove it. They didn't make this one up, no. <laughs> We've got the dog here for living proof.
At any moment, our lives can take a wrong turn, walk up the wrong street at the wrong time. We have brushes with danger we don't even know about sometimes. For want of a better expression, we call it the work of our guardian angels. But for Buddy Maxwell, it's not just an expression. He knows someone is out there, and he knows who she is. And I heard this voice in my ear, very plain, very distinct. And all it said, but very simply, was stop. Buddy Maxwell admits he's a lucky man. He's been in situations he had no reason getting out of, places he had no expectations of leaving. And today, living the good life in the California sun, he has time to reflect on what and who helped get him so far. Aside from thinking I, I've led a, a charmed life, I, I, uh, I feel in my heart that my uh, grandmother has been looking out for me, even though she's uh, been long gone now. Well, her influence over me, I guess, uh, just seems to have got me out of so many jams and scrapes that I've been into. But he felt his grandmother was always there for him. When he was a kid, after he joined the Air Force in time for the Korean War, even after he said his final goodbyes at her deathbed. I don't know if it's allowed to say this, John, but I, I just like to think that I've uh, been to hell so many times that I uh, qualify as a uh, tour guide. You know? <laughs> and uh, I just felt my grandmother hanging overhead, overhead looking out for me. That's why Buddy Maxwell wrote a letter to The Extraordinary to tell us about an incident that took place a year after his grandmother died. Today, 3,000 miles and three decades away, that night still manages to bring a tear to his eye and send a chill down his spine. I didn't used to believe in ghosts or, or, or spirits or... You know, I, I even thought the horoscope was a joke, you know, but uh, I, that's... that's, that's uh, impossible to explain it. An occasion where I was uh, visiting with uh, the relatives of some friends of mine, and we had traveled from Atlantic City up to uh, Camden, New Jersey. And the uh, evening went uh, well enough, you know, but uh, on the way back, we stayed pretty late, and I had to go back to work the next morning. I was anxious to uh, return back home to Atlantic City uh, as rapidly as I could. And uh, my friends are with me. I, I, I uh, my friend and his wife, and a uh, six-month-old baby that she had uh, sleeping peacefully in her arms, and my friend's uh, sister was asleep. Uh, they're all sleeping in the, in the uh, car with me. But he drove on, heading north out of the marshland and over the back roads of New Jersey. But from the start, it was evident this wouldn't be a smooth ride. The time of the year was. Uh, about late September, and uh, there's a phenomenon in, in uh, southern New Jersey there that uh, uh, creates sort of a, what we call a patch fog, patches of uh, high uh, humidity fog. And I'm driving, I'd say approximately 50 miles an hour back country road, and uh, just a two-lane highway was. But there's a white stripe down the asphalt, just barely discernible through the fog that I was able to uh, guide my way through the road. But he remembers he drove on for about 20 miles, peering through the fog, his passengers sleeping when something happened. I heard this voice in my ear, very plain, very distinct. And all it said, but very simply, was stop. And I looked at my friends to see if they were kidding me or, or uh, maybe somebody had to go to the bathroom. Or, I don't know what happens, you know. But they were all sound asleep. And 
I just you know, disregarded it to my imagination and I just kept on going. Didn't reduce the speed at all, just kept on going. And then, seemingly from out of nowhere, the voice called again. Much louder, much more apprehensive. And say, stop! And I got a little frightened, you know. I thought maybe the radio, where I looked at my friends again, they were still all asleep. Uh, I thought maybe the wind whistling in my ear, I closed the window. So I kept on going. I didn't reduce the speed. And then just a few minutes later, I thought it was almost like I shout. Right in my ear, screaming, stop! That really frightened me. And I stopped the car right in the middle of the road. And the fog at that point was, was so dense, I couldn't even see the, uh, the highway. I couldn't even see the front end of my car. I stepped out of the car, put my foot on the asphalt, and I felt this rumbling. And I couldn't see a blessed thing in front of me at all. So I felt my way up. I heard a, this loud rumbling sound. And there was a vibration in the road itself. And I felt my way up in front of the car. And the fog was and six inches away from the front bumper of my car was a freight train going right across the road. No lights, no warning, no signals, no other sound. But that sort of sound in my voice uh, that came out of my ear. That saved all our lives. Surely, at the speed I was traveling, we would have been killed if I just ignored that way. Finally, the train passed. It took me a good half hour or so before I stopped shaking. I was that frightened. Before I could get back in the car, and I very slowly drove back to Atlantic City. And I told my friends later on what happened, you know, and they laughed, they thought I was joking. They, they couldn't believe it, you know, but it actually happened to me. And I thought about it with reflection. I just know it was my grandmother. Tell me it was not my time to die.
This next story is one of pure chance. A young woman driving alone, suddenly an awareness of someone in her rearview mirror watching her, following her. She was about to come face to face with her past and change her future forever. Christine Reichenbach was driving to work. It was an average day on an average street of her hometown at Brunswick, New Jersey. Christine was single. She had a good job. And today she was relaxed, not paying particular attention to her rear view mirror. But after a few miles, his presence became unavoidable. Someone was following her. It's pretty obvious to but, you know, see somebody's following you, you're looking in your rear view mirror, and you switch a lane, he switches a lane. I get up to a stop sign, the next thing I know, he's right behind me already. And I was really shocked. You hear all these crazy people out there, and all of a sudden, now I have this crazy person behind me. Christine was about to have an encounter with destiny, a moment in which her past would miraculously catch up with her present and set the blueprint for the rest of her life. Sometimes I think that it was fate, Sometimes it was meant to be. But then on the other hand, you just think, well, maybe, you know, I caught up to her car because it turned that right way because I was going to go get gas there, you know, something like that, which was just coincidental. Sometimes it just goes through your head and you say, hmm, maybe it was meant to be. I believe in fate, um, yeah. It was a chance meeting that would have a happy ending, but would also open the door to a sequence of incredible coincidences for herself and the man in the car behind. Unbeknown to either Christine or her pursuer, this was a moment of reunion. They had, in fact, met many years earlier, on December 9th, 1963. The place where they met was this building, the Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital on the other side of town. Robert was born in the delivery room here at 2.27 a.m. that day. Fourteen minutes later, Christine was born in the same room. Their mothers shared each other's happiness for several days and actually speculated how ironic it would be if their newborn babies met up and married one day. For seven years after their births, the two mothers would visit each other's homes and little Christine Reichenbach and Robert Armstrong would play together. We used to, you know, play a little bit of games. He was a lot more outgoing than I was coming from a larger family. He would like try to get me to play games with him and I was always shy in the corner, you know. When we were kids, I mean, it was just Chris and it was the girl I was born next to at that time. You know, and that's how I knew her and I knew her mom and her dad pretty much. But as far as a last name, if you asked me when I was seven, if I could tell you what their last name was, it was more my mom's friend when their daughter would come over. And there were other coincidences. Both their fathers were named Roger. Bob's mother was named Doris, and Christine's was Dorothy. Both had brothers named Richard. The unlikely similarities led the two families to form a friendly bond that lasted seven years, until Robert's family moved to another town. The two children born at the same place on the same day were parted, in all probability never to see each other again. Until you flash forward to that day, many years later, as Christine was driving to work and became unnerved by the sight of a young man in her rear view mirror. I was driving and I had seen a nice looking girl in a car. Figured, you know, why not, let's follow her. And I followed her. I had been going with somebody and I was just breaking it off at the time. You know, I would date from time to time, but I really wasn't serious with anybody at, at the time I met Bobby. When Christine finally stopped and asked Bob what he wanted, she was surprised at the answer. We just started talking. I had asked him, you know, hi, how you doing? Why are you following me? Because, I mean, I mean, that's not something that I think that's normal. He uh, just wanted to say hello. He, he did all of that just to, to say hello. When each went home and told their parents about the encounter, the reaction was the same. My mother looked at me dumbfounded, like, you know, doesn't that name ring a bell to you? And I'm like, but no, I mean, you know, why should it? Just some girl I just met, why would it ring a bell? And then my mother explained that 
But what happened with me, with my mother, happened to Chris with her mother was the same thing where she didn't recognize the last name or the person. And she goes, well, do you know who he is? I'm like, no, not really. She goes, well, that's the boy that you were born next to. And I'm like... If she would have met me with my mom, maybe, and my sister, maybe she would have known who I was, but I usually don't take them to go on dates. I mean, if you don't see somebody for such a long time, I mean, a lot of things change about a person. Right there, I was almost in hysterics. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me, you know? And she said, she was like, no, she said, I, she's like, she was even amazed too. She's like, I don't even believe you have a date with her because what are the odds of you running into her? Even though she's one town over, the towns we're from are pretty large. Bob and Christine would date each other for four years before officially bowing to the will of fate in New York Central Park. It was raining and he was looking for a horse and buggy. I couldn't figure out why he was looking for those. But we would go for a walk and uh, he just pulled out a little box and he asked me to marry him. And I said, yeah. And I, I just thought it was it was strange to, to get engaged in the middle of, I mean, out in the middle of Central Park. It's not your safest place to be. She gasped for air, I remember. And I said, well, I said, I guess this is it. I said, will you marry me? And that's all it was. And she said, yeah. And that was pretty much it. The wedding took place in their hometown on September 17, 1988. And like two seven-year-old kids whose lives had come full circle, they honeymooned at Disneyland. At John Boy Screepy Cunton, follow now. Gorillas are the most fascinating of all animals, don't you think? No question we see a reflection of ourselves in their behavior. Well, in this story, the gorilla's behavior is about as close to the average guy's behavior as you're ever going to get. Allison Holloway tells us all about it. Watch closely. Ivan the gorilla, all 375 pounds of him, in a face-off with two young females. Ivan has never been in the company of female gorillas in all his 30 years, and his reaction, well, maybe what any other guys would be. Now, don't get the wrong idea about Ivan and his relationship with the opposite sex. In the circumstances, zoo officials in Atlanta, Georgia say he's doing just great with his new social life now. But that week in June, that was some week. Transferred from Seattle Zoo the previous October, Ivan was already trying to make the adjustment to his new surroundings. Then in March, the zoo let him wander outside a cage for the first time. 
He seemed to like gathering his own food. But the big shock was yet to come. It happened on the morning of June 25th. The zookeepers led two females named Coochie and Molly into his cage. Ivan had never been in the company of any gorilla, let alone a female or two females. There was a standoff from the beginning. Molly opted to be a spectator. Coochie decided to see what the big guy was made of. It was the biggest day to date in Ivan's life. It was the day that he became less dependent upon people and uh, more of an opportunity really to be a social gorilla. Today is the first day of the rest of Ivan's social life as a gorilla. By the second day, Ivan seemed to be taking charge. When he spoke, even Coochie seemed to listen. Primate experts say this is important before apes can mate. Ivan has to be the boss. He is getting more uh, assertive. And, you know, to a certain extent, that's good that, uh, you know, he's not going to be pushed around and he's not going to be aggressive and push them around. What we're looking for is a balance among, you know, in that kind of behavior so that eventually everybody will sit back and relax and they'll quit having to prove themselves uh, to each other and maybe some mutual attraction might start. Coochie and Molly seem to be playing along with the plan. And then on day three, June 27th, it happened. First, Coochie seemed to draw the line behind a line of shrubbery. Soon, Molly came into the picture, and the showdown began. Ivan had never seen anything like this in his life. Zoo officials weren't disappointed, however. They say the gorilla mating game is a complicated thing, and it can take a year or two before a couple gets serious. In this case, it may take a little longer. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, comment, and share to keep fascinating content coming here at Nightmare Nexus.